That's a nice, that's a mighty fine tree. Right there. Oh, wow. yeah. All right, so next up for our first presentation of the afternoon, we have Melody Desjardins with her blog, Modern Francos, all about the Franco American experience. Everything is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what this stuff next, but. Okay. Um. So cool. <laughs> um, Melody. <laughs> and, and November 2020, I launched my blog, Modern Franco's. Um, I created the blog after becoming involved in the Franco American community through so all through social media. Um, and I had gotten in after contacting the French community about this blog. So, <laughs> um, prior to that discovery, um, I thought that nobody else cared about being Franco American because I would search online for hours looking for anything I could find about my ancestry, history, and just any sort of community that was around um, as it is today. But um, I, I couldn't find much about it. Um, so, or I would find websites or blogs, but they were long <clears throat> abandoned um, and they didn't have much information anyway. Um, so my search results would never get too far. And so I would kind of get hopeful and I would give up again. <laughs> get hopeful and I would give up again. Um, it seemed that the only people who knew what Franco American was was uh, my mom's side of the family. Um, and so once I had searched around, I really got into digging in 2019 and I found the French Canadian Legacy podcast. Um, and I was pretty shocked at that. Um, so I started listening to them. And contacted them. Long story short, I do the French community news segment for them. Um, I've been doing that for a while, and then that kind of came to other blogs like Le Podcast and Ma Family Canadian en Français, Ma Famille Tour. And seeing all these projects um, it was really inspiring. And I had been wanting to start a blog anyway before all of this. Um, so then I finally took my idea because I didn't know what I was going to do. And I would have wanted to do something with Franco-Americans, but I just didn't see anybody else talking about it. Um, so um, I figured the blog would be about Franco-Americans of the day and how we can connect to our past. And, um, and when I was trying to figure out what I was going to say today, I went back into my early notes about modern Franco's. Um, and about five months before launching the blog, I had typed up a list of what of what I had wanted other Franco Americans to get from the blog. Um, and I had a list, but I just chose the top two. Um, so I think those are just more fitting. Um, so I, I had typed uh, modern Franco's blog ideas, <laughs> Franco culture for people who have no clue where to start, <laughs> which was me. <laughs> and then <laughs> simplifying everything so it's not overwhelming. Which, yes, that is for me too. <laughs> so I tried to start from that case because um, um, if you weren't aware, I was born in New Hampshire, but I actually grew up out in Iowa. And in my section of Iowa, there were no Franco Americans of the Midwest. Nobody had, no, nobody knew what Franco American was. They'd never heard that term before. Even if you were out there and say French Canadian, they either you know, okay, they don't know anything about it. Um, and so when I say the uh, um, no clue where to start. Yeah, I, I had no clue where to start. Um, so I try to keep that in mind when I'm writing these. Um, and so when I write new posts, I end up learning a lot. Um, and I, I also wanted to do it to connect with other younger people in my age range, because a lot of times too, I would search and I'd find all these clubs and groups, and then I would go on a Facebook page and 
um, it would be a lot of older people that I couldn't really connect with too much. I could kind of connect with them, but not as much as when people are in your own age range, because um, the experiences are different. Um, so I wanted to write for Franco Americans who grew up with similar experiences of knowing that they were part of a distinct culture, but not knowing much about it beyond the traditional foods of the holidays or in my experience, being the only kid in school who knew all of these random French words um, and had a meme. Um, so uh, many of us knew of the term French American growing up, but we were never able to describe what our culture was beyond the surface. So that's where modern Francois comes in uh, to take what is already there in the history and culture, create something new out of it, or dig deeper into the past and figure out who we are and have a solid grounding of our culture. And in the past, when I've been asked, what is your heritage? I wasn't able to give a full reply um, when I would answer Franco-Americans because I didn't know what else I could say about being Franco-American beyond those few um, aspects I briefly mentioned. Um, I can tell people that I also have German ancestry and I can go on about um, all sorts of things that German Americans do, like Oktoberfest and specific traditions with them, but I can't do the same with Franco American, um, the Franco American side. Um, so that also inspired me to work on these poems and try to um, do some new things with this. But through uh, connecting with others in this community, I've been able to find answers to many of the questions I had for myself as to who we are and what it means to have our culture. Um, so many of us in the younger generations were never taught French, um, we were never told about our history. Um, and we never had the deeper aspects of our culture passed down to us. Um, most, of, most of who we are has been forgotten about. Because um, when I was growing up and I'd learned the term Franco-American, uh, it was spoken as a culture of the past and there wasn't much to it besides some food and then, you know, Meme and Pepe stories. Um, and I had never even heard of the term Franco-American until I was about 12. So that was surprising too. Growing up, I knew we had French heritage. I knew I had French heritage on my mom's side, but I just kind of connected that French to France and Quebec in some sense, but I didn't know the full story um, of, the, of immigration from Quebec into the world. Room. And I didn't think that anybody had a distinct name for it. Um, but my mom knew that all that time, and she didn't tell me until 12 <laughs> years old, and I had to ask her. Um, so although some of us may have grown up knowing bits and pieces, we're still trying to figure out what our culture is and what it means to us. Um, and I think a part of knowing ourselves is looking at our history and finding another kind of passage in it. Um, with one of my earlier posts, uh, Four Life Lessons of French and Bourgeois, I wanted to tell the story of these young women who were brought over from France to populate New France. Um, and we can look up this history and read fact after fact about it. Um, but I began thinking, what else are we really getting from this? So I wanted to find a deeper meaning in the history by remembering the hardships these women went through and honor them for their bravery, uh, no matter what reason they had for working the ships to New France. And so by outlining the inner qualities they must have had in order to make that journey and survive their daily lives, uh, we can make a more human connection to these women who became the founding mothers of Quebec. So I wanted to write a more creative piece that was more than what historical fact could offer because when you were reading online about it, um, I saw a lot of downplaying of the role these women had in giving life to Quebec. Um, uh, outside of our French Canadian Franco-American circles, it's highly suggested that they were prostitutes or, they, or that their part in having children to repopulate was easy because it was just expected of them at that time. Um, and I didn't want them to be seen only for that role that they played, um, but for who they were as women at that time and the, the kind of strength and resilience they must have had in order to overcome such a harsh reality. Um, and the same goes to my most recent post, how no girls and working mothers redefined Franco-American womanhood, where I wrote about the significance of women back in the old days, their roles in becoming early working women or devoted mothers and henceforth. Uh, being a wife and mother is an important role, but we're still women outside of those roles. And that's what these Franco-American women did. 
defining themselves against the living standards of their time. Uh, in many cultures around the world, uh, women are considered the transmitters of culture, uh, primarily were the caretakers of children. Um, and oftentimes women created all of the traditional recipes that we enjoy today. Um, and they often made the clothing that we see in older photographs. And as one of Franco's, I want to honor those more feminine contributions for culture that aren't remembered that much in historical context. Um, so when it comes to Franco-Americans, um, we don't really have what other cultures have in terms of celebrating very specific holidays. Um, that kind of I don't even know about. <laughs> um, learning more about our history, cooking traditional foods, having um, our own music and history, culture, and um, but also with a sense of artistry um, to add a strong visual of materials and environments that our ancestors used to, to work with um, and how that can make us a more distinct, recognized culture. Um, I, wrote, I, I wrote a post a while back titled uh, Why Franco Americans Should Be Embracing a Culture Through Traditional Dress. Have fun and discuss what our visual rep representation of our culture would be. I think there's a lot of power in something as simple as fashion and its artistry. Um, selecting certain colors, patterns, and pieces of clothing that combine with historical dress with some folklore. Um, and I think we can embrace our creative side through these many artistic paths. Um, as well as our history, we tell our story, um, embrace who we are, but more importantly, know, know who we are. Question for you. Um, have you, what is your, your mom's side of family think about Dubois and, and providing a voice for their, their own culture? Like, have they provided any feedback or um, any conversations about it? Yeah, um, my mom really likes it. And um, she has three sisters and they all know about it. And I certainly have subscribed to it. <laughs> <laughs> but they do know about it. Mm -hmm. um, or they've liked the page on Facebook. So, yeah, no, Has there been an impetus for conversations about identity and whatnot amongst your family? Um, or facilitated that perhaps? Kind of. I mean, among, I mean, on my Franco American side, really, it's just my mom and my three sisters at this point. Um, but even back when they were growing up, it was kind of their whole identity was kind of iffy because my man, man, Pepe. From what I can see and what I've heard, they seem to have had, they seem to have found more identity in being Franco American through speaking French and the Catholic Church. Outside of that, um, it wasn't really much more than that to them. Which town did you grow up in? I mean, or, I, or did, were you I was where they're from? Briefly in Wilton, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Well, moved around quite a bit, so yeah. I, I grew up in southern Iowa. Oh, okay. And that's where your family was from, though, was in that area? I'm not sure you're from MMA, was that where they... Yeah, they were from Nashville. Nashville, okay. So then, okay. Yeah, so, um, and the same thing with my mom and her sisters. They kind of had more of an identity in being Franco-American in speaking French. But by the time my mom was born in 1957, um, at that time, she picked up some French, but it was mostly, it was kind of starting to get more... Anglicized because um, when she entered parochial school, it was they'd have a lesson in French, but it wasn't the half day mm -hmm. that her two older sisters had. Yeah. Um, so her two older sisters are fluent in French, um, and my mom and her younger sister they know some French, they can speak conversationally, um, but and they know more than what they got on to. They're kind of they're really <laughs> self conscious about it, um, so. Yeah, they found it interesting in that. And my mom had told me when I first made it, um, uh, she said, I can't wait to learn more about my Franco American heritage. And oh, that's I thought that was, it was just, it was sweet, but it was also funny because I'm the one always going to her to ask her yeah. questions um, about when she grew up. Uh, her section of Nashua, and maybe I could call it a little Canada because mm -hmm. she remembered it was a very tight knit Franco American yeah. community. Most people spoke French. 
on most of them were French American. She knew, like they had some Polish and Irish neighbors, but it was primarily French American. So um, it's interesting too, because when I started getting involved with all of this, I heard all these stories of families who were discriminated against and I, my family never went through that, it seems, because they were around um, other Franco-Americans. They were the majority in this area of Nashville, so they never experienced any of that. So that really surprised me, because growing up, um, being, being Franco-American, to me, was very positive. Mm -hmm. um, I never knew my, my Pepe passed away a week after I was born, but I kind of knew my Meme. Uh, she passed away when I was 12, and I didn't really grow up with her. But she was never ashamed of it. She was always very proud of it. Yeah. So I know that was a long time. I know that was a good I just started going before. Like before. <laughs> so, uh, where are you doing your research for it? And how much research do you do for each post? Are you like, you know, are you like digging really hard into stuff and then you have to like pull yourself back or like how does that all work? Mostly for research stuff, I ask around. <laughs> That's Patrick plenty of times for the sources he has. Um, he just tells me things because I really don't know where to look. Um, before I would just go to Google, and just, you know. But then you don't you don't find much specific stuff there. That's mostly where I find my research. I ask people for it, um, and I mean it, to write a post with all the research, it can. It take like two weeks or something. Um, I try to get a post out every other week. Sometimes it's just life and work. And then, yeah, usually like two weeks. Start something, do the research, make sure that it's all good, and then finish it up. And then, sorry, that was my stereotypical librarian question. <laughs> 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 Um, I think it's um, particularly talking about the experience of Franco women, I think is really interesting. I was talking with Emma last night, we were talking a bit about how a, a large percentage of the mill in Winifred, which was, at, Libby said it was at, at one point the biggest mill in the world, the, the biggest textile mill anyway. Um, and the the majority of the people working in a lot of these mills were women, and um, particularly women who were coming from farms, coming to the city to make money. Um, and often it felt, seems like what we're reading is that there's a lot of independence to be gained from working in these mills, even though it was grueling work. They weren't on the farm anymore. Um, and you talked, when you mentioned um, expression through fashion, um, I first of all had a question about that folklore element of the fashion. Um, so that's kind of the first prong of this question. And the second prong, I guess, is wondering how we can connect that to what um, <laughs> Emma had said the male owners of these mills would call frivolous spending, which is the, the money that the women wouldn't send back home to their families, they would go and spend on these stuff like yeah. purses and you know and fashion items and i'm pretty sure that um any expendable income that men make was not considered frivolous mm -hmm. um you can quote me i don't know i could be could be wrong <laughs> i don't know but i think so um and so i guess i'm i'm you mentioned that little bit about fashion and i'm, I'm curious to hear more kind of in that context through that lens yeah yeah i'm still doing some research on that because yeah it's just kind of it's already not there. It's just, I always thought, like, you know, I can look up Oktoberfest mm -hmm. and everyone there is in, uh, I don't know, you're German too, so I gotta make sure I say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Wiederhosen. Yep. And they just, they, I don't know, they just have that specific thing yeah. that they can all come together with. And um, there's an event in Pella, Iowa, um, a large Dutch, uh, population there um, and they celebrate the Dutch heritage and they have their own like folkloric traditional dress and I went to Tulip Time um, in 2017 or 2018 and it was just so interesting how and about half the town isn't even of Dutch heritage but they want to make sure that that stays 
um, there. And so they have all these floats uh, and they just do their, uh, yeah, they just do their thing. And all the little cute little school kids <laughs> are doing their Dutch dance because they learn Dutch dance in the public schools there. So it's a really large part of who they are. Um, and they have the little outfits and they're dancing down the street and it's, you know, it's just really fun. Um, so I, it, so, and with the German connection too, I always thought like, oh, is there anything like that for Central Americans? And there really isn't. Um, so. We have some really fun snowshoe uniforms with like interest oh, in yeah. that regard. But that's the only thing that I can think of from the collection. Like these are open. Oh, no, I wasn't sure if we were still good on time or we have a couple minutes. Oh, okay. okay. I, I did want to mention to Melody that um I put uh, oh, your blog up here, so oh, yeah. not to embarrass you or anything, but here's here's her uh um I'll just go I'll just go to blog. Yeah, I haven't updated it in a while. I have to I wanna like do a whole revamping of it. I just haven't had the time. So, oops, this is uh, what you were just mentioning about mill girl, mill girls, yeah. right? Oh yeah, and I want to talk about the, the frivolous spending thing, that sort of thing. As it relates to fashion. Right yeah, yeah, so um, looking into that is really interesting too. The only frivolous male spending that existed was the pourboire, because <laughs> that was given so that you could drink after your shift, and the, oh, the wife at home couldn't find out. <laughs> oh. Pourboire. And look at where you Maine is now. So yeah, it's just it, it's like it's I kind of lost her. Like it's hard to explain um when you have these other cultures like Dutch and German heritage that already have those kind of folk that folklore element it um established already it's just kind of always been how it was so yeah no, i thought it was artistic mm -hmm. yeah no <laughs> okay Kevin, you can go <laughs> oh no I, i've already asked way too many questions but I, <laughs> I love all these presentations so so great job um and your blog just looks amazing. Um, and one thing I appreciate about, like one of the great virtues of your blog and basically the whole group here is like, you're finding new ways of addressing new audiences on topics that have been around, but need to be kind of reevaluated in light of a different experience, like different generational experience. So kind of connected to that, what have you found, maybe you have words of wisdom for us, what have you found really works? Like, are there, and this is just like, Maybe it's not words of wisdom, wisdom, but like in your experience, what with your blog has really resonated with people? Is it, you know, is it specific topics? Uh, because like you get, like if people don't know this, like she gets thousands of views and thousands of reads. Um, so like, is there something specific that like people are like, yes, we need more of this, or where the responses may be even beyond their expectations? Um, yeah. So I mean the. Blogs that have the most views is that Phoebe Watts one um, that I wrote. And then I think like this one, and maybe the one below about the flags. I think people are really interested in the visual stuff mm -hmm. and in the women's history stuff too. Um, that's where a lot of it. Yeah, I know some of you have this lot in your field, but they're in Kodak, okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
And I, I really like visual cues. So I'm a little bit of an art beast. So <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I kind of lost for words. I don't really know how to explain myself. But um, yeah, I don't know. I just think visuals are really important to a culture. So it's just what I'm trying. I was thinking maybe I should make cards for a beer, like my thing. But that is smart. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 